I'm going to tell you a relatively sad story. Her name was Miriam. Um, she was a light-skinned, red-haired, very young and beautiful woman. I was an oncologist, and together we have been fighting against her cancer for almost seven years, going from relapse to remission, and then from relapse again, from chemotherapy to another chemotherapy. Uh, all of a sudden, one day, her cancer completely changed its behavior. It started to grow at an extreme speed, becoming resistant to everything, every kind of treatment. We have tried everything. We have tried anything. All trials, the cancer did not respond anymore. The cancer that was perfectly controlled for almost seven years, within weeks, became completely uncontrolled and started to spread um, its metastasis everywhere in her body. A few days before she died, we had a chat. We discussed about, it was one of the saddest uh, talk I had in my life, because we were talking about her death. And while we were talking, she said, she told me that a few weeks uh, before the cancer started to regrow and become resistant, her husband left, most probably because of the, her hair loss, because of fatigue, because of lack of libido due to the treatments. She felt that she had no more value for her husband, and at the same time, no more value for herself. She felt that she was not strong enough to continue to fight and struggle for her life. She wanted to die, and actually, this is what happened. She ultimately died at the age of 31. After that, for years, that's 45 years I'm treating cancer patients, for years, I've been trying to understand if there was a relationship between what happened to her a few days, a few weeks before her cancer changed completely its nature, and the fact that she was so sad because she was left. Could it be possible that there was a relationship between sadness, stress, and cancer? Well, um, as a professor of oncology at Pierre and Marie Curie University, as head of one of the largest, most important Department of Medical Oncology in Paris, I was the responsible for the National Cancer Plan and, uh, that we had in France from 2002 to 2007, and the former president of the French National Cancer Institute. You can imagine, I had a large and very frequent access to the media, giving interviews on the cause of cancer, on the breakthrough discoveries that can give hope to patients affected with this disease. And during all these years, when I've been explaining cancer in the media, I've always denied to accept the idea that there was a relationship between stress and cancer. Why? Because as, as a scientist, because of my official social status, I consider myself as somebody that couldn't say something about any, anything in science that was not demonstrated through, through what we call the scientific method. What is the scientific method? It's a method that has been set up by a French scientist in the middle of the 19th century called Claude Bernard. What he was saying in summary is that for each cause there is an effect, and from each effect there is a cause, and the relationship between the cause and the effect is reproducible. But is there that we can demonstrate the relationship, if any, between stress, sadness, and cancer? through the scientific method. Let me tell you, there are several things that actually cannot be proven, but although through, uh, through the scientific method. For instance, if we all of us have the deep intuition that the parachute will save the lives of people jumping out of a plane, can we demonstrate it through the scientific method? If we want to do so, we have to take about 20 volunteers, 10 with a parachute, 10 without parachute, and push the 20 of them out of a flying plane and see how many survivors in the two groups. Can we do that? No. If we want to think about the stress and cancer, can we take, for instance, 2,000 women, each one with a little baby, split them into two groups, kill the baby in front of their mother for the first group, and see if in the following years, these women, these mothers, are going to have more cancer than the mother that we have kept their baby alive? Obviously, we cannot. Does that mean that parachute does not, does not save people jumping out of plane? No. So, indeed, there are things that are true, but that cannot be proven through the scientific method. Now, if it cannot be proven through the scientific method, how can we move forward? 
Actually, in my last book about stress, sadness, and cancer, I explained that there is a lot of not randomized prospective studies are killing the babies in the two group of, of mothers, but retrospective studies and experimental studies on animals that have shown that there is a very strong relationship between stress, sadness, and cancer. For instance, I can give you two studies. One is a very interesting Israeli study that has shown that survivors from the Nazi camps have a higher risk of cancer. That was stress, really. You can, there is another very beautiful study from Scandinavia which has shown that, more, that widows were left their uh, husband, but we are alone, completely alone, no babies, no relatives, no friends, have an increased risk of cancer too. And we know the mechanism, how, can, how stress or sadness can contribute to the development of cancer or to the relapsing of cancer. For instance, we know that stress can increase the secretion of some hormones that are not very good for your health, like cortisone or adrenaline. We know also that stress can decrease the activity, the efficiency of your immune system, that system which is made of antibodies and white blood cells that can protect you, us, from any threat, including viruses, bacteria, and also most probably cancer cells. We all of us know that if you are very stressed or very tired because of that stress, you may have the onset of uh, uh, herpes, labial herpes. And this is due because your immune system is, is, less efficiency, is less efficient because of the stress. We know also that stress can decrease the capacity of your cells. You know, a human body is made of one million billion cells. Each day of your life, you lose about 70 million of cells, and every day of your life, if you don't want to shrink, you have to build 70 million of new cells to replace those who have died. But is it possible that every single day of your life, you are going to make 70 million of anything and never do something that was wrong? It's impossible. There is no industry in the world uh, in, that can produce 70 million of something every single day and never do something wrong. So you do some wrong cells. But hopefully, there are mechanisms of, to regulate the, uh, the danger of these wrong cells. For instance, you can repair the mutation that can occur in the DNA of your cells and avoiding these cells to become malignant. We can also provoke the suicide, which is called the apoptosis, the suicide of mutated cells that, in order not to be a threat for the other cells, prefer to commit, it, to commit suicide, to die. And we know if very well, there's a lot of studies that have shown that stress, sadness, can decrease the capacity of your DNA to be repaired from this mutation that can occur spontaneously every day of your life, and that can decrease the capacity of the mutated cells to commit suicide in order to protect the other cells. So that's the how. But coming to that point, let me make two, two, things, two points very clear. The first one, I never said that sadness or stress can cause cancer. I mean, uh, compared to tobacco smoking, to bad nutrition, to viruses and bacteria, stress, sadness can have a, have a very minor contribution to cancer. But you know, one cancer affects one man out of two and one woman out of three in our countries. Trying to decrease a little bit of that risk is not insignificant. The second point I want to make clear is that uh, cancer is not that every type of stress or sadness can induce an increased risk of cancer. Uh, all the studies have shown that it come, it, stress can, become, can induce that increase in the risk of cancer only if it comes to a point where you cannot cope anymore with that stress. Same for sadness. When sadness is so important, so durable, that one day you wake up in the morning thinking that you, it will never end, and that moment you said, you know, in your, in your head, you say, I would prefer to die. It's too hard to continue to live with that sadness, with that stress. When it comes to that point, then it can induce an increased risk of cancer. Why? How? That, coming to that point, I want to tell you a very interesting uh, uh, experiment that has been done by a French scientist about 30 years ago called Professor Laborit. What he did is an experiment in three phases. In the first phase, he took a rat, single rat, in a cage with a bridge coming to a second cage. 
Each time he puts an electricity on the floor of the first cage, the rat escapes and goes to the second cage. And he puts the electricity, a stress, on the second cage and the rat escape in the first cage. After the end of, at the end of the experiments, these rats are very tired indeed, but they had no cancer. F second part of the experiment, he took two rats, put them in the same cage with no bridge. Every time he puts some electricity, some stress, what happens is that the two rats start to fight one against each other. At the end of the experiment, they are again very tired, but they don't have cancer. In the last part of the experiment, he takes only one rat, put it in a single cage, again with no bridge. Every time he puts the electricity on the floor, that rat can neither escape nor fight. At the end of the experiment, these rats have an increased risk of cancer. How does that can tell us? Actually, there is a very nice theory that can be summarized on that way. Men, as men, women, human beings, have always, always been prey. They have been prey for wild animals, but even more often prey for violent men. They try to kill them. And in order to survive to that risk, humankind, mankind have developed a strategy which can be called fight or flight. Indeed, if a lion is going to jump on you, you don't have any other possibility than either prepare yourself to fight or start to run. It's no time to think about the book you have read about how lions are attacking people and so on. There's no time for that. So it has to be something very intuitive, very instinctive. And this can be summarized by fight or flight. As long as you can fight or you can fly, the stress is not going to create any risk of, of disease and any risk of cancer. But when it came to a point where you can neither fight nor fly, then it becomes dangerous for your health. This is what the experiments of Dr. Labory told us. When the rat could escape, when the rat could fight, they didn't have cancer. When it came to the third part, when the rats, the rat, the single rat, could not neither fight nor fly, it started to have cancer. So we explain how cancer, or uh, how stress or sadness is going to increase your risk of cancer. Now we can try to, in, to answer to the question of why. Why? If you are a prey and you cannot fight or fly, why do, do you have a cancer? And then it comes to a very personal ID, to a very personal theory I want to conclude with. You know, as I said, a human body is made of one million billion cells. Everybody, everything which is living in that earth, plants, animals, or human beings, we are made of these cells, human body, one million billion cells about. Well, we all can accept the idea very easily that when I move my arm, this is due to the contraction of my muscular cells to the order coming from my brain through the nerve and so on, and I move, I can take a glass, drink some water, whatever. When it comes to the spirituality, as human beings, it's hard for us to understand and to accept the idea that this is also due 100% of my cells. Why? Because I am my one million body cells, and my million body cells are myself. There is no part of me which is out of that million billion cells, and there is no cells that belong to me which are out of me. We are exactly the same. So, even when it comes to the spirituality, to the faith, to the freedom of choice, to love, to whatever to, that deals with your spirituality, actually it is yourself which are living that feeling. If I love somebody, it's because my cells are loving this person. If I hate somebody, it's because my cells are hating that body. And at the same hand, if I feel being stressed or sad, it is because my cells are feeling sadness or stress. And when it comes to a point where I said, you wake up in the morning and say, you know, it's too hard, I prefer to die. And we all know people and yourself, maybe that someday we have think, thought about something like that. Your cells are so stressed, so sad, that they want to die. And this is how cancer can happen. So when we say that, what, how can we conclude? Indeed, as an oncologist, my advice is to not smoke, to improve the diet, to do some exercise, to get vaccinated against HPV and everything. But at the same time, try to control, to get a better control of your emotion and of your stress. If you can avoid that, it's even better. But if you have to leave that, 
try to help yourself and control better your stress, your sadness, by psychotherapy, sophrology, meditation, uh, squared breathing, and there are so many other possibilities. But take into account that as you try to improve your diet, as you try to improve because you want to improve your health, which means to decrease the risk of having cancer, please try to work also on your emotion and on your stress. Thank you very much.